first of all, I would like to express my joy at being awarded the Creston Medal by the School of Theology and Religious Studies here at Catholic University. I note that uh, Johannes Queston was a member of your faculty for no less than 41 years, from 1938 to 1979. For myself, I cannot claim the same longevity, for I taught patristics at the University of Oxford for a mere 35 years, <laughs> from 1966 to 2001. But during those 35 years, I made constant use of Quaston's classic multi-volume patrology, and I regularly recommended it to my pupils. Quaston, along with other Catholic patrologists of his generation, Jean Danielou, Henri de Lubac, Yves Congar, and others, has served as a creative inspiration, not only to members of his own church, but equally to Christians of other ecclesial communities, and not least to us who are members of the Orthodox Church. So with all my heart, I take ad advantage of this present occasion to express my gratitude to them all. Also, I would like to express my gratitude to Father Paul McPartlin for his fair, balanced, and witty exposition <laughs> of the Ravenna document. When he stressed the need for us in our ecumenical dialogues to listen to one another, I thought of an incident in my favorite radio program from my student days, The Goon Show. <laughs> uh, in one occasion, the telephone goes and Harry Seacombe lifts the receiver. Hello, he says on the telephone. Hello, who's speaking? I can't hear you. Hello, who's speaking? And the voice the other end says, you are speaking. <laughs> oh, he says, I thought the voice sounded familiar. <laughs> and he puts the receiver down. Now I hope that our ecumenical dialogue has advanced beyond that particular stage of communication. When I was at the Orthodox Catholic Ravenna meeting, one thing in particular struck me, and that was the presence everywhere of the Italian police. I have never been at a religious meeting in which the police were so numerous. That started from the moment of arriving on the Italian soil. As I was driven from Bologna airport to Ravenna, there was a police car with lights flashing going in front of the car in which I rode. The police were there outside the hotel where we were staying, outside our meeting place at the church of Santa Polinari Nuovo, along the road between the two places. When one wanted to cross the street, immediately there was a police officer striding out in front, stopping the traffic, enabling you to go over. They were everywhere present, invariably courteous, but I asked myself, why are they all here? Had they received warning that our conference was threatened by terrorists? If so, 
there were, in fact, no disturbing incidents of any kind. Were they there to protect the citizens of Ravenna? <laughs> This elaborate police protection gave to our meeting a certain feeling of unreality. <laughs> I'm uh, relieved and reassured that there aren't quite as many police officers with us this afternoon. <laughs> Let us first look back from Ravenna 2007 to the last occasion when Catholics and Orthodox met at the highest level. That was the Council of Ferrara, Florence in 1438-39. During that conference, the delegates spent about 10 months with some interruptions discussing the Holy Spirit and the Filioque. They spent about four months uh, discussing purgatory and the state of the departed. They only spent ten days discussing the papal primacy. Today, I imagine, that would not be our order of priorities. There would surely be general agreement on both the Catholic and the Orthodox side that the crucial point in the Orthodox Catholic dialogue is the place of the Bishop of Rome in the Universal Church of Christ. Now, since the inauguration of the present Roman Catholic Orthodox Dialogue at Patmos and Rhodes in the year 1980, this crucial point has not yet been addressed directly. The two sides in 1980 chose, as Father Paul has noted, a different method of approach from that adopted in 1438-9. The Council of Ferrara, Florence, started with points of difference. The present dialogue has chosen to start with points of convergence, to seek a foundation of shared convictions before turning to the traditional causes of East-West confrontation. The Ravenna document does not yet deal in detail with the question of the universal primacy and the infallibility of the Pope. But, as was said by Father Paul, it prepares the ground and sets the scene. And if we study the Ravenna document with care, we can find there certain guidelines of vital importance. I say study with care. Father Paul said that the Ravenna document is readable. Well, I wonder. Don't come with false expectations. You won't find in the Ravenna document very many jokes or colorful anecdotes. It does call for quite careful study. And sometimes it's using the somewhat encoded language of ecumenical documents. But, yes, there is in the Ravenna document a great deal that is worth exploring. Now, I should like tonight to carry further what has already been said about the distinction of the three levels of primacy. 
the local, the regional, and the universal. And then I would like to note in the second place the way in which the Ravenna document emphasizes the principle of mutuality or reciprocity. As regards the general approach of the Ravenna Agreed Statement, a first thing we may note is the way in which the church is seen in Eucharistic terms. Here, the Ravenna document is following out the line of thought pursued by people such as de Lubeck and uh, Metropolitan John Zizulus of Pergamum, whom Father Paul has so convincingly discussed in his book. Eucharistic ecclesiology could be briefly summed up in the words the church makes the Eucharist and the Eucharist makes the church. And there's a similar perspective in the Ravenna document. We are told the Eucharist in the light of the Trinitarian mystery constitutes the criterion of ecclesial life as a whole. And later on it is said in the Ravenna document, at the heart of tradition is the Eucharist. Closely linked with this Eucharistic perspective is another general point underlying the Ravenna statement. The church is seen uh, in terms of communion or kinonia. The word communion forms a leitmotif throughout the pages of the Ravenna text. Ecclesial kinonia, we are told, is the gift by which all humankind is joined together in the spirit of the risen Lord. A little later on, we find the words, the bond of communion constitutes the very being of the church. Also, communion is the frame in which all ecclesial authority is exercised. Communion is the criterion for its exercise. So, in the light of this Eucharistic understanding of the church as communion, what does the Ravenna statement say about the three levels of primacy. I have a great liking for the number three. When I was ordained priest, I asked the bishop who ordained me for some guidance in the exercise of my future ministry. And he said, always have three points in your sermon, not less and not more. <laughs> Actually, I think it's quite enough to have one point. <laughs> when I was consecrated bishop, I asked the presiding hierarch for his advice about my Episcopal diaconia, and he gave a rather different answer. He said, always fold up your own vestments at the end of the service. The deacons will make a mess of it. 
Now, as we have heard, the Ravenna document is built round a distinction of three levels. The primacy first of the local bishop in his own diocese. Local primacy. Then the primacy of the chief bishop, the protos, they use the Greek term frequently, in a particular region, embracing a number of local churches. And in the third place, the primacy of the chief bishop in the universal church. Now, in the Orthodox Church today, the second level regional primacy means the patriarchs and the heads of the different autocephalous churches. And it would be generally agreed by Orthodox and Catholics that in a reunited Christendom, the third level of primacy, the universal primacy, is to be exercised by the Bishop of Rome. In the Orthodox Church today, universal primacy is exercised by the ecumenical patriarch, Parche Bishop Hilarion of Vienna, about whom I shall not say anything further. The fact that the ecumenical patriarch is first in the Orthodox Church today is beyond dispute. How that is understood is a different matter. Now, let's apply this threefold distinction, first of all, to the Pope. The Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity in a working document issued in 2002, puts the point succinctly. The Bishop of Rome acts simultaneously as Bishop of a local diocese, as Patriarch of the Western or Latin Church, and as universal minister of unity. Let me quote a parallel statement from a Greek Catholic from the island of Chios, sometime prefect of the Vatican Library, Leo Alatios, who died in 1669. In his masterwork, De Ecclesiae Occidentalis at qui Orientalis Perpetua Consensione, published in 1648. He distinguishes exactly these three levels in the ecclesial uh, diaconia of the Pope. It's a very interesting book that I would recommend to all of you, uh, even though it could more appropriately be entitled De Perpetua Dissensione, <laughs> written in a pre-ecumenical era. In the Roman pontiff, uh, says Leo, there is a threefold power. The first is episcopal, whereby he is joined to the Diocese of Rome. The second is patriarchal, whereby he, in the same way as the other patriarchs, governs the provinces assigned to him and exercises authority over the bishops of those regions. The third is apostolic, whereby he presides over the whole church and rules it as vicar of Christ. And this third power he has received from no one else than Christ, despite the objections raised by innovators. 
There he has in mind not the Orthodox but the Protestants. The Supreme Pontiff, he continues, has as bishop everything in common with the other bishops. That's an interesting point that is also mentioned in the Ravenna document. There is sacramental equality between all the bishops of the church. Grace is conferred through the sacraments and the Pope has not received any sacramental blessing beyond what is given to every bishop. So then, we can agree with Leo when he says, the Supreme Pontiff has as bishop everything in common with the other bishops. As patriarch, everything in common with the other patriarchs. But as vicar of Christ, endowed by the Lord with apostolic power, not only does he stand on a higher level than bishops and patriarchs, but he also wields authority over them, strengthening them, promoting them, and if need be, deposing them. Now, clearly the third level is where the problems begin to arise. But let's think a little bit more about this threefold distinction affirmed in the Ravenna document. Is it merely making a statement of the obvious? I think not, because both on the Catholic and in the Orthodox side, there are certain tendencies which obscure this threefold distinction, which collapse the triad into a dyad. On the Catholic side, there is very often a tendency to ignore the second level, the level of regional primacy. Ecclesial authority is often seen in terms of on the one side the episcopate and on the other side the pope. A typical example is the document put out by Archic, the dialogue between the Anglicans and the Roman Catholics in 1976. It discusses at some length the position of the Pope and what the Anglicans might perhaps be willing to ascribe to him. It discusses at some length the position of the bishops. But the other level of primacy, the regional level, is almost entirely ignored. When that document appeared, I wrote to the two chairmen of the dialogue since they invited comments and pointed this out but I got nowhere. My objection was merely brushed aside. But more recently, look at the papal encyclical Ut Unum Sint of 1995, which has very many positive statements. But you will find the level of regional primacy is very, almost entirely ignored there. More recently still, we Orthodox are bound to be disturbed and puzzled at the omission from the Annuario Pontificio of 2006 of the papal title Patriarch of the West. Does this mean that the present Pope does not attach any importance to the second level of primacy, regional primacy? I hope not, but I have to say that we Orthodox remain unhappy about all of this. 
Curiously, at the time of this omission, the former pre prefect of the Congregation for the Oriental Churches, Cardinal Achille Silvestrini, is reported to have said that the deletion was a sign of ecumenical sensitivity. I couldn't help raising my eyebrows there. So far as the Orthodox are concerned, there are a great many other papal titles that we would be glad if you drop. <laughs> but Patriarch of the West is one of the titles that we have no problem about at all. <laughs> The Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity commenting on this omission, and it seems that they were not consulted in advance, says that the title has been omitted because it doesn't have any clear meaning. Because the word West has uh, today no explicit point of reference. Well, my reaction as an Orthodox is to say, if the meaning of the title Patriarch of the West is unclear, would not the correct course be to clarify it rather than abolish it? In fact, the omission of the title Patriarch of the West goes against what was stated at the Second Vatican Council in the decree on the Eastern Churches, Orientalium Ecclesiarum. There it is said that the patriarchal structure is an institution of the whole church. And it is specifically said it is not an institution only of the Eastern Church. So I myself hope that we shall continue faithful to the line of Vatican II. For us Orthodox, a theological principle of major importance is at stake here. Does the Roman Catholic Church recognize a distinction between on the one side the patriarchal jurisdiction of the Pope, his jurisdiction in the West, however you define that, his jurisdiction over the Latin Church, and on the other side, his universal jurisdiction in the East as well as the West. In the other words, does he claim the same kind of jurisdiction over the Christian East as he has over the West. I think that if we are going to make progress on the question of primacy in our dialogue, we've got to make a distinction here. And I think the Eastern Catholics would also be concerned that such a distinction should be made. Now the present Pope, in writings published while he was a professor of theology in the 1960s, insists that there is a distinction between the patriarchal status of the Pope and his position as universal primate. Professor Ratzinger, as he then was, is quite clear on that point. Has he changed his mind? The orthodox standpoint is that the universal primacy of the Pope, level three, can only be correctly understood if seen as the summit of a pyramid with other levels of primacy below it. If the universal primacy is isolated from regional primacy, then in our view, it becomes distorted. 
Now, if on the Catholic side there's a danger that level two in the Ravenna triad might be ignored, on the Orthodox side, there is certainly a tendency among many Orthodox today to deny level three, the universal primacy. Let me quote just one example. The ecumenical patriarch Demetrius I, predecessor of the present ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, stated explicitly in 1973, no bishop of the Christian church has a universal privilege given by God or by man over the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Christ. We are all purely and simply fellow bishops under the one supreme high priest and head of the church. Christ. And you could find plenty of other such examples in Orthodox writers who seem to exclude altogether the third level of universal primacy. It would be unrealistic of us in this room not to recognize that there are very many Orthodox who say the Pope is simply the senior among the patriarchs. Nothing more than that. At Ravenna, however, and to me this is a point of major importance, the Orthodox definitely and explicitly accepted level three, the universal primacy. I quote from section 41 of the Ravenna Statement. Both sides agree that Rome, as the church that presides in love, according to the phrase of St. Ignatius of Antioch, occupied the first place, and that the Bishop of Rome was therefore the protos among the patriarchs. They disagree, however, on the interpretation of the historical evidence from this era regarding the prerogatives of the Bishop of Rome as protos, as first. Now, this is in a section entitled Universal Primacy. So they are not just discussing the position of the Pope as the senior patriarch but they are discussing his relation to the patriarchs of the East. And this is made clearer in section 43. Primacy and conciliarity are mutually independent, interdependent, sorry. That is why primacy at the different levels of the life of the church local, regional, and universal, must always be considered in the context of conciliarity, and conciliarity likewise in the context of primacy. Concerning primacy at the different levels, we wish to affirm the following points. One, primacy at all levels is a practice firmly grounded in the canonical tradition of the church. Two, while the fact of primacy at the universal level is accepted by both East and West, there are differences of understanding with regard to the manner in which it is to be exercised. So the Orthodox quite clearly at Ravenna accepted the principle of universal primacy. 
I hope they all noticed what they were doing. <laughs> there is, however, the question of the reception of ecumenical documents. It is one thing for a group of delegates who have discussed the matter at some length to make a common agreed statement. But will this statement be accepted in their respective churches? And again and again, the problem has been that ecumenical dialogues are carried on in a kind of vacuum and that the statements are not fully accepted on the two sides. And I think there's going to be problems, there are already problems, in the Orthodox Church about this statement affirming universal primacy. But I personally am entirely willing to sign it with both hands in purple ink. <laughs> now I would like to come to my second point, mutuality. Ravenna says that the details of what is meant by universal primacy vested in the Pope remain to be worked out. And that is true. But already the Ravenna document lays down a basic guideline for the working out of these details. And this basic guideline is the principle of mutuality or reciprocity. That's my phrase, not theirs. And this principle is closely linked to the understanding of the church as a communion. Already in section 13 of the document, the Ravenna statement quotes the well-known phrase of St. Cyprian, that the bishop is in the church and the church in the bishop. That, I think, concerns primacy at the local level, the relation of the bishop to his flock, and it implies a mutual relationship. No bishop, no church, but equally no church, no bishop. Each depends on the other. Then, section 14, a more general statement is made, and I think this applies to all three levels. For Christians, it is said, to rule is to serve. The exercise and spiritual efficacy of ecclesial authority are assured through free consent and voluntary cooperation. So there again, mutuality is being emphasized. Authority is not just one way from above, downwards, below. There is free cooperation between the primate and those whom he is serving. And yet more clearly, the document goes on, section 24, to quote Apostolic Canon 34. Now, I'm sure many of you in this room know that canon by heart. It is central to orthodox canonical law. But it's had less influence in the Latin West, and so you will forgive me if I venture to quote it but people like to be told what they already know. <laughs> this canon dates probably from the late fourth century 
it background would be from Syria and it is accepted in the canonical collections of the West. The bishops of each province, the word used actually is ethnos here, must recognize the one who is first, protos, among them and consider him to be their head and not do anything important without his consent. Each bishop may only do what concerns his own diocese and its dependent territories. But, and please pay attention here, the first, the protos, cannot do anything without the consent of all. For in this way, concord will prevail and God will be praised through the Lord in the Holy Spirit. That reference at the end to the Trinity is surely very important. The church is an icon of the Holy Trinity. Primacy and all forms of authority in the church should reflect the perichoresis of the Trinity. Now, that canon is actually referring to level two, to regional primacy. Can it, should it, be extended to apply to level three, universal primacy? Ravenna does not say this explicitly, but reading the document as a whole, it at least hints at such a possibility. If so, we have here an understanding of universal primacy, the universal primacy of the Pope, that might eventually be accepted by the Orthodox. A primacy that involves mutuality. The protos is not to do anything without the involvement and the consent of all. So the idea here is that primacy, yes, is from above downwards those over whom the primate rules are not to do anything without his consent, but he too needs to obtain their consent for what he is doing. Primacy implies reciprocity. The bishops to do nothing without the protos, but the protos, in this instance the pope, to do nothing without the bishops. Now, is this what the Ravenna document really means? Is this acceptable to the Catholic side? I think we've got to discuss this at considerable length in the future. The Council of Florence settled the question of privacy so it thought, in 10 days. We in the present Catholic Orthodox dialogue are prob probably going to need rather longer than 10 days. But let us remember the words of that great pioneer in the work of Christian unity, Father George Florovsky. The greatest ecumenical virtue, he said, is patience. But, I would add, we also need impatience. The first chapter in the Ravenna Statement uses the word urgency. Questions of Christian unity are not simply remote and abstract. They are urgent. 
So, we need an impatient patience and a patient impatience. Thank you.